This is an oral history recording made with Mrs. Frances Jerram on the 15th of July, 1996. She's in conversation with Jill Roberts, the Leonard Cheshire Foundation archivist. Mrs. Jerram, your involvement with the Leonard Cheshire Foundation was in the very, very early days, 1949 to 52, I think. Yes. And you were um, at the old building in Lee Court. How did you first become involved? You knew Leonard Cheshire from the war, I would imagine. No, 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 only in, in, in the newspapers. No, I uh, trained as an armourer after the war. The Red Cross trained me for that. And uh, my first job was at Portsmouth. And that was just at the time of the new wonder drugs, when they were having great success with the young TB patients. And so after about six weeks or so of treatment with proper convalescence, they could then get back to real life. And there was just nothing provided for them in the new National Health Service at mm -hmm. all. And a friend of mine who is in who was at Southampton, had the same trouble. So we went up to Lee Court. We'd heard it through um, St. Thomas's Hospital, I think it was. Oh, right. They told us about this, but we didn't know much about it. So we thought we'd go and see. And um, so we drove up there and found this incredible place. So what, what was so incredible about it? Was it... Uh well, here was this large stone house, looking almost empty, really, with a large uh, oak front door. And we rang a bell, one of those pool bells, uh, which, which reverberated through the house. And after a little while, it was opened by a small, slim man, very speaking, very quietly indeed. Turned out to be the famous group Captain Cheshire. And he welcomed us in and uh, said he was hoping we'd, we'd come to lunch and took us down a, a dark passage past the kitchens to what I suppose was the old um, servants' hall. Mm -hmm. And there before us was an encapsulation of life at the first Cheshire home. Lunch was laid on a bare trestle table. There were just enough implements to enable everyone to eat at the same time. There must have been about 12 people sitting down to lunch. Among these was a very aristocratic old lady who was very deaf a retired nurse in the advanced stages for TB, and Ted, with his arm in a splint, who did all the odd jobs, carrying coal and so forth. He was, worked as a linesman with the telegraph people. I soon got into close conversation with him about form on the turf, but my friend at the other end of the table next to the group captain was um, asking all the right questions uh, that we... <laughs> Uh, so to ask about the sanitation and the patient's recreation and so on. And how did you get the impression that he was coping as an amateur? Well, he just, you know, coping is a good word, he just took it all as it came and, you know, did what came to hand next. I mean, rather like the way he was serving this lunch to us, a bit of a hot pot it was. It, it might have been serving royalty with all sorts of grand things. And, um, he, he, he almost felt he made up the answers. I mean, you know, there was no very real uh, uh, plan of action about mm -hmm. anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, after, after lunch, uh, I told him that I got two patients, who, young men with TB, who needed this, this period of convalescence, and I, that's what I was looking for, somewhere for them. And I asked him about the fees. And he was, uh, he was rather sh shocked, really. He didn't, he hadn't really got any fees arranged. I mean, the old lady called Mrs. Wilkes, old granny, oh, Wilkes. She had an old age pension of 26 shillings, and she gave him 25 and kept the shilling for herself. Mm. However, I managed to get from the National Assistance Board at the time the, the best amount I could, which was three pounds five a week for each of my cases. And were these the first fee-paying cases, yes, you think? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. indeed they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to me, um, well, if you can get the your patients, what about these other patients here? Couldn't they pay me some, you see? So that's how it all began. I, I, I was so captivated by all this, and, and I offered to go out in the evenings after work and um, see them, and see if I could interview them, you see, and see if I could find a way in which they could claim this money. So I got in the habit of going there about twice a week. 
and uh, that was how that began. Mm -hmm. And then you, but your, your involvement became much more formal, didn't it? Much more full-time. Ah, yes. Well, the, I, I, I must tell you how, how it came about. He um, asked me to go full-time, give up my job and go full-time. And I did, without an awful lot of time to think it over. But what has really won me over was that a few nights before, sitting in the kitchen with the light of a candle, having cocoa with him before I went home, um, he began to talk about another home that had been offered to him, which rather horrified me at first, as this one wasn't really going properly. And then he began to talk about his vision for the future. And as he did this, in this dark kitchen, I could see, and I promise you I could see, these little lights coming on, on and on and on, into the dark, almost into infinity. You might think of them as an extension of the candle, little flames coming on, or stars, or what, I don't know, but they were little lights. And I, I saw that, and it was a sort of vision that he gave me, which, well, captivated me, of course. Mm. What a lovely picture. You'd actually given up work, I think, given up a job. Well, then, yes, then I went back and gave my notice. I was, uh, as, you, as I've already said, of course, earlier on, I was an arm and a Portsmouth chest clinic. Mm -hmm. And so I gave them my week, month's notice and um, came back in June to take the job of being, um, I think I was called fairly early on warden mm -hmm. at Lee Court. Um, by that time, he had a most splendid person called Sister Olive, who was uh, Queen Alexander's nurse, sister, who had TB, and she wasn't strong enough to do any nursing, but from her room on the first floor, she organised an absolutely splendid nursing service um, from all kinds of volunteers, some trained, some not trained, uh, all sorts. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to do the rest of the house. And, and were, the, were the residents suffering from all sorts of illnesses? Oh yes, the range, they were. She wasn't, yeah. Yes, the, the, uh, at the beginning they tended to be these TP TB people, but th it wasn't awfully good for us to have the advanced cases, so we weren't really the best place for them because they needed such a lot of care. Uh, and we found we were being asked to take uh, the young chronic sick, as they were called. Now these were young people suffering from multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease or something like that, who otherwise were in part three accommodation in in in. Um, Chronic uh, wards, yes, geriatric wards, as old people, you see. Mm -hmm. And so as the armors began to hear of us, mm -hmm. so we got asked to take these people, and we felt it was a sort of a rescue operation. Mm -hmm. And they came, some with wheelchairs, and some with crutches, and some not, but, I mean, all, all were absolutely splendid people, some with, you know, really good brains and gifts. Mm -hmm. And how many, average, would you think, a dozen? Or? I think um, uh, as soon as we were able to be registered with the Medical Office of Health, uh, I think we registered for 21. What was, it, what was the atmosphere inside the old house like? Yes, um, you see there was no heating there. Somebody had put some um, central heating at one point, but it, it wasn't working, so there's no heating except open fireplaces. Um, people like Toc H would come camp out with us over the weekend and cut down trees to provide, to provide um, fuel for the fires. Uh, the, and of course the lighting, we had lamps and candles, and you can imagine how dangerous we felt that was with all these people uh, lurching about all over the place. So that had to be put right pretty early on. No money, so the food was a bit difficult, but still, we all managed to eat and survive and do quite well on it, I think. Mm. Oh, it was a lovely old house because, you see, there was so much room for wheelchairs and things and everybody could get about. And there was a large room 
we started, it started off by being used as a dining room, and then when GC wanted to get in even more people, this was on the QT one day when Sister Olive was away, uh, he told me to turn the dining room into a ward and provide six more beds or something. And you never said no. So we got the beds, we got the pillows, I think, mattresses. But I was absolutely stuck for blankets. And um, I'd been round all the beds once and taken one off here, one off there. Anyway, I found the group captain and I said, I'm very sorry, but we it's only two or three hours to go and these two men are coming and I haven't got any blankets. And he said, as he always did, oh, well, something will turn up in time. And then he changed his sort of tone of voice and he said, there's a, what's that big parcel in the hall? Why don't you undo that? And there was a big, sort of done up in sacking. I thought it was a couple of chairs. And in fact, it was. Uh, when I undid it, there were enough blankets for my beds. Um, uh, dear old Ted, who was going around with his buckets of coal with his good arm, came past at that time, and he wasn't really a believer exactly. So I said to him, how's that for, for faith, Ted? How's that for faith? And he said, oh, they do say the devil looks after his own. What about G.C. the person? He must have been, well, I know he was tremendously charismatic. Um, how did you feel about him? Well, I what, think... Uh, what made you dedicate so much to him? Well, you see, I had a, 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 this period of a month after I'd given notice to my old job to think about this, and I thought to myself, are you going to do this job because you are, um, you know, fallen in love with the group captain or something? Or do you want to do a job? And I, I was quite convinced, my own self, that this was God-given. It was a job I had to do. So um, that was why I went to the job. But you see, he was so sort of charismatic, if that is the right word for him, that he, he made these things possible. He put them in your way. He, he provided the job, so to speak. And, um, but the, incidentally, the time I got there, he'd quite changed his mind about which job I was supposed to be doing. But in the end, I, I was doing the one I think I was the right person to do. And, um, oh, he's a lovely person. I had enormous affection for him, as, as, as we all did. Mm -hmm. But um, he, that was his thing. He was, he was, he, he inspired, he inspired. And everybody else followed and, 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 and worked hard and, and the patients put up with hardships and things like that because he, he inspired us all to do this. Of course, he was away quite a lot. Um, I, mean, I was never really well, I suppose, uh, after the war. Uh, at first, I mean, I, I don't know what diagnosis was, but he was frail. And um, so sometimes he was away. And it was awful when he was because, you see, you felt, well, it was called GC's faith, wasn't it? And um, you felt that his kind of faith meant that the Lord would provide whatever happened, and I wasn't so sure that he'd do the same for me. <laughs> but Didn't GC come to you one day with a dream he'd had about St. Teresa? Yes, he used to think a lot about St. Teresa, <laughs> and on this occasion he was uh, staying briefly in the laundry cottage with his parents because he hadn't been at all well, I think he had the flu or something, and he sent for me to go and see him, and uh, I suppose perhaps he was a bit depressed with the flu, but he said to me, Francis, I think that I've been arrogant with all this, and we must give up Lee Court as it is at the moment and hand it over to the National Health Service. That's the right thing to do. It will be better all round. It, it's purely my arrogance. And I, since Theresa came to me in a dream last night, and I saw this is what she meant me to do. Well, of course, I was absolutely horrified because the one thing that we were good at was doing what the National Health Service could not do. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, GC, I'm terribly sorry, but either you heard wrong or St. Theresa wasn't fully informed of the facts, but I'm quite sure it's wrong for us to go over to the National Health Service. 
And in actual fact, I don't know, I think he was rather surprised at my remarks. We, we never did. And the rest is history. Something else you've, you've already mentioned about him as a person, which I found interesting, was that you could never really, you said that you never really got to know him as a person until you'd been almost let down by him. That's an interesting facet to his character. Yes, you see, you, 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 if, he, if he found you and thought you were just the person for the job, as for instance, did me when I was to go and be the warden of this, you are made to feel absolutely tremendous, you see. You are the one person that really matters, and you must go and do this job. Well, if, as also, as a matter of fact, happened to me before I got there, he changed his mind, and you weren't the person for that job at all, but he thought he got something else for you to do. You began to realize that um, he was, um, well, human like the rest of us, and he changed his mind, and he wasn't just sort of all powerful, or holy, or all those sort of things that people thought he was. And therefore more easy to deal with. Yes, oh yes, yes, and then, then you more nearly on a level. Right. But it was, I must emphasize, it was the, the charisma that was the thing, the way he just was able to somehow other arrange that the right people were in the right place to mm -hmm. do the job mm -hmm. he wanted. Mm -hmm. So you were there until, as we said, for three years. Talk me through a typical day, or wasn't there such a thing? <laughs> oh, that is a difficult question. I, uh, it depends where it was. I don't know, you just never stopped all day. You, you, you got up, and I don't know if you were helping with the breakfast, perhaps, or, um, I don't, I really can't answer that. It was, it's just, you just worked hard all day doing whatever happened. I mean, if there wasn't any fuel for the fire, somebody fetched it, mm -hmm. or if somebody fell down, you picked them up, or if you had to go to the shop and try and talk them in to let you have some more groceries on tick, or, Oh, one thing I must tell you, which is quite fun. When we'd at last gone public, as it were, one of the newspapers at last published an article, which you see hadn't allowed to happen before. We got this publicity, all kinds of offers of help came in. And one day when I was very busy in my old overall, one of the patients came to me and said, there was a gentleman to see me from America. So I went to the front door, and there was my idol. There was Robert Montgomery, blue eyes and all. And he had heard about this, and he'd come down to see if there's any way in which he could help by raising funds back in America, I think it was. Well, of course, I was bowled over and overcome by all this. But, of course, vital to this was the group captain. And so I had to find him. Well, he was asleep upstairs, having had a bad night, probably he'd been up with somebody, he was ill or something. And normally one would have dreamt of disturbing him. However, I shook him and shook him and said he must come down, there was somebody from America who was offering to help. And he wasn't at all interested. And then of course he never let me forget it. I said, it's from Montgomery, do you see? He's got the most beautiful blue eyes. Anyway, I got him down there at last. And so he went and did his stuff. I can't really quite remember what the end result of that was, but it did generate. Uh, interest mm. overseas. I've never heard of a connection with, uh, with Robert Montgomery before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's a long time ago. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, um, another thing I remember after the um, article in the News Chronicle, uh, as all kinds of gifts kept pouring in, an office of help, one day a blind man and a sighted woman arrived at the door, the man carrying a portable typewriter. They said they had read the article and felt sure there would be a lot of letters of acknowledgement to write, and they'd come to help with this. On one occasion we needed a hundred pounds by a certain Friday to pay a particular account. GC had, as usual, seemed maddeningly unconcerned and said we shall have the money in time. On Friday, Cyril was wading through all the letters with postal orders in from old age pensioners and so forth, and he left until last a very scruffy brown paper parcel. He opened it, and there, wait for it, were a hundred one-pound notes, anonymously. 
This was called the result of GC's faith. We laughed and said it seemed almost unfair how this sort of thing seemed to happen for him every time. Amazing. So we're in 1952 now? Yeah, just about, I suppose, yes. Um, towards the end of your involvement? The end of 51, anyway, yes. Yes. How did your involvement actually come to an end, then? Well, you see, um, everything had been involving, evolving during those two and a half years. And whereas when I first went there, it just wanted somebody who was prepared to sort of keep the ball rolling, as it were. And then, but by degrees, things began to happen. And then um, GC's father, Professor Cheshire, formed the, the trust, the Leonard Foundation, and the Cheshire Foundation, I think it was called, mm -hmm. with Lord Denning. And so that put the whole thing on a proper footing. And from that, it wasn't far off before the day before we had a management committee appointed. And this was formed of various, very excellent people who had helped us in various ways from outside, including someone who was prepared to be the treasurer for the home. And so there we had at last the proper administrative setup, and they could do the hiring and firing, and um, there's a bit of money to do this with now, and make the arrangements. So my job there, as I had seen it in the first place, uh, well, very naturally came to an end. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I, I like to think that if you think of it in terms of, of acorns and oak trees, uh, my job was to water this acorn and look after it that GC had built and keep it alive, whatever happens. And then, when it got strong enough, you know, and the shoots were beginning to show, then it was time for a proper gardener to take over and rear the tree. It's a lovely analogy. Francis Durham, thank you very much indeed. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.